Okay. Well, hello everybody. My name is Bolik. I'm the director of OIV3. And as you know, this event has been co-sponsored by the OI Valley Green Coalition and transition to organics. Thank you very much for your cooperation. Um, that was wonderful. Second, I will tell you a few words about the program. First, we will have a talk by Rick Anthony from 2.15 to uh, uh, 3.15. Then we have questions and answers. And then we have a break with snacks on the outside. And then afterwards, we have a panel discussion for about one hour, 15 minutes. And the facilitator of the panel is Jen Myers. He's the vice president of the Green Coalition. And there are four panelists. One is Andrew Pagolin, uh, executive director from the Transition to Organics. And there's Wene, Wene, she's an expert on water efficiency and water conservation. And then you have David Goldstein here. He works at the Ventura County uh, Environmental Division, he's also a columnist and an environmental analyst. And then the fourth person is not here yet, uh, Steve Sprinkler from the Power Money Cook. So there are four panelists, four top experts, top facilitators, top speakers. Uh, yay! Okay. Next point. This whole afternoon will be video recorded. Panelists agree, I still have to have some with the agreements. Uh, but if you don't want to be on the video, just don't send it. <laughs> <laughs> then we don't have a lawsuit. <laughs> okay, now the most important uh, point of the presentation. I would like to introduce you to Rick and But in fact, I'm not going to introduce you, but I want to tell you how it happened that he agreed to the talk here. Fran Faraz. Uh, she's a teacher at the college where uh, Rick also is teaching. So she will tell you about him, how they met, and how he agreed to come. And then later on, Eric, I just, we just met before, he will add some more information about the transition. First, I want to thank friend because she is the one who made him all great to come here. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. So great to have all of you. Thank you so much for coming here. It's a beautiful day out there and being here. It just means um, where your commitments are and where your interests are to be here and listening to such important conversation um, that we are having today and this issue that uh, you know we are bringing so beautifully for us all about it. Uh, my name is Fran Faraz and I'm the director of Peace Studies program at Wilkins College. Uh, and uh, we do a, a yearly peace conference at the college, and all of my students they kept telling me, "You got, you got to have a camp at the conference. You got to, because you know, with Peace Studies, we uh, human rights, economic rights, environmental rights, they are all interconnected. You know, people are kind of seeing it more and more how these." issues are so interconnected with one another. We cannot have peace without justice, without environmental rights, without earth rights, without uh, human rights. So <clears throat> they kept asking me, have him, you know, speak at the conference. And uh, eventually we, um, I, I, you know, we, we were connected and I asked him and he graciously agreed, although he has a really tight schedule all the time. Um, so uh, without further ado, I read a little bit of, of the, uh, um, bio that um, we shared at the conference, and um, Eric is going to add to whatever I have, I have said. Uh, so Mr. Anthony is an internationally recognized expert in the area of resource management. In the past several years, he has led international dialogues on zero waste in Brazil, the Philippines, and Italy. Mr. Anthony is a founding member of the board of directors of the California Resource Recovery Association, the Grassroots Recycling Network, and the Zero Waste International Alliance. He's a professor of zero waste at Irvine Valley College and an instructor at, in the Coalition of the California Resource Recovery Association Certificate Program. 
So um, please welcome Eric Thank and Mr. Great right now. Yeah. <laughs> Who is this man? <laughs> this guy is uh, an amazing leader and educator. In, in the early 80s, as a student in uh, uh, environmental studies at UCSB, even before that, when working in LA, I wanted to find out how to make LA's pilot recycling program work. So I went to the California Resource Recovery Association meeting. And who was running that? This guy and putting together a team of recyclers and government uh, managers to the early parts. This is before recycling was even cool, right? And then recycling started to happen, and Rick ran operations with government and nonprofits in San Diego, working with the businesses and the contractors and making recycling happen and into the early 90s, and all the while building the organizations and the sub-organizations. Further down the road, he's tackling intractable things like uh, uh, reeses in restaurant uh, effluent and things that really mess up the works. And then further on down the line, building coalitions with other countries and regions all around the, uh, all around the, uh, the, the world on recycling. And where does that lead? Earlier, uh, we were just talking about how to introduce, introduce the concept of zero waste. We talk about zero waste, it sounds so idealistic. And, and I kind of joke, it sounds like world peace. Uh -huh. And Francis, <laughs> that's what I do. <laughs> so Rick, through his formulas for zero waste achievement, will be a harbinger of world peace. Yes. So you'll get everything in that same package. But uh, in, in over the past five, uh, five years, Rick has convened international conferences here in the United States and around the world, working with cohorts to find out ways to put the concept, this high-minded concept of zero waste into practice. Back in, uh, back in 89, California passed a law that said, in the next 10 years, we want to cut the amount of material going to landfill by 25% and then 50%. And we hit that easily. Easily, and now we're going to 75 percent. So when when I talk to people and and ask them, what do you think of zero waste? Zero waste. What's what's zero waste? You know, other than the way the world works, right? In nature, there is no waste, and we're part of nature. So now it's time to apply our role in nature to the mess we make. And so when we talk about zero waste, we say, well, that's a, that's a really ambitious goal. Say, yeah, well, that's just that's just unrealistic. And then the showstopper and the thing that really gets them talk, uh, thinking, and this is what's been working on me. It's like, all right, great, not zero. How much waste are you for? <laughs> what kind of life do we want to design in our infrastructures, and how much waste do we want to expect? So when we say zero, it's not going to be achieved overnight. But Rick is going to outline where we come from the tools that are available, and the ways to get there. And it's a, it's a really exciting uh, afternoon, something that I even canceled garden plans for. Um, and hopefully, as a result of today's uh, uh, jam of information, we will have a little working group here, maybe starting Ventura County Zero Waste uh, uh, Association, and go to the area cities and say, let's do a policy. A statement. Let's aim for this zero waste because it's the right thing to do. And it makes sense bringing up all the other programs that we're doing. So uh, Rick has a long and storied history and he's bringing all this wealth and experience to us today. Let's welcome Rick Anthony. Thank you, uh, my name is Richard Anthony, and my life is garbage. <laughs> but I am in recovery now. That's my one joke. Um, I've been doing this for about 40 years, 1970. Uh, come out of the, uh, born in Los Angeles, East LA, lived in Inglewood, Marineside High School. I went to school in Long Beach State, uh, graduated with a master's degree in public administration. 
74. Um, I was there from 64 to 74, which was a great time to be in universities in California and lots were happening. Those of you who are there know what I'm talking about. And, and uh, I was part of the Civil Rights and Peace Movement, and we were the most successful college. We won uh, open campus organizing in 68, uh, before they shut down Valley State and San Francisco. So we were right there. And one of the, one of the things we had was an active uh, in war peace movement, looking for another movement, really. And 1970, uh, they shot some students at Kent State, and uh, everybody went on strike. And at the same time was the first Earth Day, uh, April, about the same time. And uh, literally, we combined with the environmentalists the, and work people to shut down the campus and look for the future. We were also uh, running candidates for the student governors. And it was a joke. It was, you know, we were going to take the money and work for peace. And by God, we won. <coughs> we won the whole $2 million AS budget, which was amazing. And uh, when I went to Carlos today, he said, I need a job. Uh, he said, well, you're real late, Rick. He said, I read the campaign. You're late. I said, well, what do you got? Said, uh, well, Earth Day, they set up this recycling center on the bottom of the campus, and uh, people came in and brought all these bottles and cans and newspapers, and they had these volunteers, and they were selling it, and the volunteers are gone, but the people are still coming, and the administration's on my back, and your job, Rick, is to either clean it up or make it work. And uh, I know you ran my campaign, but I promised Shinmore I need to be the manager. So you're the assistant manager. There'll be two of you, and it'll be a dollar an hour. <laughs> now, Shin, Shin had a business degree, and I had a public administration degree, and we walked down to the site. And uh, we sat and we stood there, and it was a banker lot by the dorms, and there was a steady stream of cars coming in. Um, and uh, oh, I think the first one was some faculty wife in a Mercedes and had a mini skirt on. I had to walk on these cops to get up to throw the newspaper. And we were, no, that was all interest for kids. And then the band came in with the hippies with the flowers, and we're going, you know, I'm going, what, what's driving them? Why are they coming with them? And Shin's going, what's this stuff for? So we went out and marked, figured out the market. And what happened was there was a strike in Canada, and they couldn't get wood pulp for the paper bill. So they were relying more on secondary coal. And for the first time, Maya jumped in 10 months. So when we sold our first batch of newspapers, we got thousands of dollars. Shin goes, get more bids. So I'm going, well, why are they doing that? They doing? So bottom line was the strike ended in the price went down to 10. But we have a going business hired students. Today, Bombay State so I got 50 workers on their AS recycling center, their certified retention center. They, uh, they bring in half a million to the campus every year. And, um, a guy that I worked with in the 70s, uh, Johnson, who was part of the buyback industry, until he blew it money and retired, and then decided he wanted to do something, called me the other day and said, hey, I got a job. And what are you doing? And all that. He said, I'm a manager of the Long Beach State Recycling Center. So we created a job back in the 70s that were, that were needed to happen. We were there, and I, I kind of fell into it, but uh, I, you know, what you have to do is be a student to be working for the AS. Now, it wasn't smart enough to write my own position in like they did later on. I don't think we, we made so much trouble while we were there. It was the administration was glad to give me my master's degree. They're all in the back row going, yay, he's gone! And that was okay, because it was time to move on. And we, uh, what happened is in 1976, they passed the records. But they, in 68, they, they have the Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act. And what that stopped was you couldn't have open burning dumps and you couldn't throw them in the ocean. And so EPA, Public Health Department now, the EPA is going, oh, what do we do? And so they hired engineers to figure out what to do. And so we were in Long Beach running the campus recycling center and we were the hotline. And these guys in Long Beach, as you said, engineers were doing all the work for the EPA on recycling, on drop offs and collection programs. I'm fascinated. I'm, you know, I'm looking for a, a good, relevant job in my new world. As I'm a young kid, I want to work for the presidency. I'd like to do something good. I'd like to walk my talk. So uh, we go to conferences. We show up in our old rows and our long hair and jump on the engineers. And Bob Stern is a pretty, pretty smart guy. I uh, said, you know, come on down uh, and interview. And I interviewed. They, they hated me. But I said, look. Uh, I got an office paper reprogram. I've got recycling on site. We're doing curb. This is 1972, you know, 74. My God, we got where the first was. I got all this experience. You just got this contract from EPA to figure out what they're going to do with all the recyclables. You need me. He's a guy that engineers. But 
I said, what I'll do is I'll organize your desk. I'm a public administrator and organize your library. And that's why they hired me. This is a tip for the young people looking for jobs. Offered to do some real work around the office. I worked there for four years. We did the first curbside rural program in California, San Luis Obispo. That was my program sort. Uh, we did all the office paper programs for the EPA. Uh, using in Sam as our program nationally. Went around the country monitoring what we did. About uh, 78. 79, 76 they passed, four of the past is always Management Act in California, requiring every county to have a plan. We started writing plans at SCS, we did uh, San Luis Obispo, we did uh, Redding, Chester uh, County, uh, and a couple other ones. And Fresno County decided I actually hire somebody to implement their plan. So in 1979, I'm, I'm 29 years old and I'm a principal manager in charge of all the garbage for Fresno County. That job. And the reason I had the jargon, nobody else knew because they, they were coming off the road to these open burning dumps, and then all I knew was how to put dirt on or, and, or do a fire with it. But at SES, I had learned from the engineers and the design of sanitary manifolds and all that. And I, kept, I was a recycling guy, I really was. And I was at Fresno too. When I left Fresno in uh, 87, we were at about 40% or something. I think we're any rules. We, we just did it. We, we, all the all the rural cities had brought off centers so that we could have rural recycling transfer and build a firewall. We did that. We did that. And we also did the first double line sanitary landfill in Southern California, uh, American Avenue. That's fine. Six years of going in front of the public and saying, "Don't worry about it. It'll be safe. Don't worry. I, I, I won't ever do that again." And I know you guys. Well, the reason I didn't take the job in Detroit County kind of because of that landfill fight that was going on in the 80s on the new landfills. Huge, huge argument here about location. And Fresno, we found a place that was relatively safe and we double lined it, they pump it every day, and it's a model for landfill. But as a landfill manager for 20 years in government, and from, uh, from Fresno, I went to San Diego County, I was in charge of all the landfills and all the resources covered there. And we had, when I walked in there, the reason I took the job, I'll tell you why. Uh, Fresno, we had competing landfills. And so, you know, we lower, we lower upper price, everybody would lower the price to go somewhere else. So, you, you know, now you, you can't do anything good because you're competing on burying in the ground. It's stupid. San Diego County won't know them. And they had a tipping fee that was 20% less, well, 80% less than what I had in Fresno. So, literally, I walked into an area where there was a gold mine of money left on the table. And when the Board of Supervisors said to me, uh, okay, fine, you're going to set a landfill for us, but what's, where's your recycling plan? And I went, what? The one recycling plan for San Diego County. Okay, uh, fine. Give me, give me, give me a couple of weeks. And we came back, and it was being said mandatory recycling. It was a uh, 1.5 million a year, and we funded. Uh, we were at 10 uh, percent disposal. And they finally took us out of the game. We had dropped the landfill from uh, 3.5 million times a year. We gave all the city's products and did it. Eric, Eric about you. We did this with, we did this from landfill money because there was no competition. We could go from 20 to 30 and have millions of dollars to give people trucks. And, and we said to all the cities, they're gonna do it, it's gonna be a blue bin and a green bin and a black bin, and everybody's gonna have it. And, you know, that bunch of stupid colored bins all around. And that's what we did. And we built that infrastructure. And uh, we were rolling, we had a big firm in the world in San Marcos. It was a $125 million facility. So, I'll set this story. The, best, the end of the story is that no good deed goes unpunished, but the fact is you make, you make, you make friends in the world and you grow, and, and that's really what's more important. So what the bottom line was happening is we took a $10 million government operation and we were generating $150 million a year. Uh, private sector. Well, they sent a politician to sell the site. They'll get money for it. Really? Price Wirehouse did $100 million. I said, what are you talking about? We got 200 we have a billion dollars worth of airspace that we can sell that we've got permitted. So they sold it for 200 million. Uh, and I'm a business. Golden Goose is gone, and now today they got issues on what to do with the organics and no funding structure to do that. And our big issue now in San Diego is we're going to have to have a zero waste plan for the county. Period. To talk about what to do with the organics. And that's part of my presentation. I spent 40 years in the business where there were no rules. I'm sorry, you know. Burn it, fire, okay, bury it, put some dirt on. That's it. We wrote the rules. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'm sorry. I said this, I, they said shut up, Rick. I understand that. Um, I was in a public science time, I was here. 
But we didn't know in 1970 uh, how much VJ would come from the land. We didn't even know how fast it traveled in the ground. We didn't know any of those things. Today, we know down to the nano part of it. We do. And so there's no more excuse. No more excuse. So now it's, I mean, this is actually a, just EPA now in Region 2 and in Region 4. Not 9 yet, but 9 is pretty good. That's our reason. It's adopting the zero waste approach to resource management. And what we're saying is look, you're at 60%, anyhow, you're managing resources, you're just not doing a good job. You should be doing it 90%. Really? You're thinking about that. So, the Swiss actually hired me to help uh, put together their textbook uh, and the zero waste approach for resource management. They talk about burning too, but they recognize all their incinerators are half full now because that's stupid. If you could get $150 a ton selling resources, why would you pay $150 a ton to burn? That's a $300 difference. Unless you're stuck in a long term contract that you can't get out. Whoops. So, that's what's happening. So what we did is we said, okay, if we're going to say zero waste, we better define it before they say zero waste is better than the other one, And this is our definition of zero waste. So basically, it says, uh, basically, zero waste is adopted like a planet. It's based on natural cycles. Everything's part of something. You don't put something false into the environment. If you read Cradle to Cradle, I don't know. Anybody read Cradle to Cradle? Because of the so what does he say? It's recycling and it's organic and there's no middle ground, right? That's the bottom line in Cradle to Cradle. And that's what we say here. Everything in products is going to be designed either for recycling or composting. And no, no, you can't put your toxic materials in our air, in our water, in our land. No. So design the product without a toxic material. You don't have to have a toxic residual. You don't. A nuclear power plant, my God, the Japanese designed those power plants so well. When that earthquake came, it just it rolled. It rolled. It was perfect. It just it didn't come apart. What happened? Nature and the tidal wave came over and slapped over the damn thing, and that's when they were storing the nuclear rods because they didn't have a place to put it. But the whole site for nuclear power rods. So why would you build something if you couldn't get rid of the waste? It's going to be there for a million years. Why God? So no burn, no bury, no toxics. Now we said reduce. We said reduce, and uh, we took this around the world. And I, I'm not kidding. We went to Naples, Italy. They hadn't collected garbage in three years. <laughs> People, the, the landfill was full. The EU is phasing out landfills. The engineers wanted to build the incinerators. The farmers and the public said, no, no incinerator. You can't do it. So, I've never seen a, a brain floating off and runs the government and says, okay, do it yourself. So, outside of Naples, just 10 feet high on all the roads, you see packs of garbage. You see bale garbage on the roads. So, we walk into town, zero waste, 25 extras. The day we hit town, they opened the landfill. What? And uh, the lady is looking at me, and I'm from the Italian newspaper, Mr. Anthony, what are you doing here? I said, well, you know, it's a, it's a paradigm shift. Or, you know, it's, it's a revolution. So next page, revolution in Naples. <laughs> I said, it's a revolution from waste management to managing resources. And we said, talk, by, by the Friday, with the public said, Turn on the computers and the cameras, and they start talking about the mafia and the mafia government and how these local control politicians were screwing up all their, their hazardous waste trucks into the volcano. It just went on. It was terrifying. And they were upset. And they basically said, no, not not reduce, eliminate. It's gotta be, it's gotta be a clean environment. And they were absolutely right. I want to say that uh, five years later, the new mayor of Naples is a zero waste guy. So that it works. It, it was a unifying concept. Uh, it was scary when the, I said uh, they have to adopt these global principles before we uh, go They want to march in the city hall. Oh, call my wife. I won't get my name in the newspaper. I blew that one. But I'm not going to march in the demonstration. I promise you. And they said, well, we're going to march to city hall. I said, well, we're going to deal with these global principles first. And if you buy into them, they get some consensus. Okay, well, well I'll just get back. Well, no, you'll get fine. And I said, the police are here. Yeah, they're, they're in front of us. They're going to they're guide us down to the city. <laughs> In Sicily, I said, Paolo, we're going to march in the streets. Are you kidding? The mafia is here. He says, nah, don't worry about that. They're either in the banks or in the government offices. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, we call them Republicans. <laughs> I'm sorry. Usually I get thrown out of the parties for that one. <laughs> so this is the definition of zero waste. And we've taken this definition around the world. Around the world. And it's pure review. So now you'll see uh, these, uh, you know, Libra, uh, 
folks. Lab, underwriter laboratories, uh, these ANSI, they're starting to zero waste from landfill. We said, well, yeah, zero waste is not only from landfill, but it's no incineration. It's no mining. It has to be. It's all about the air, the water, and the land. So we, um, so we might find zero waste from landfill, but the incinerator is not the option. It's got to be better. But these I'm talking, I get to this. What you're finding out is this, this is not framing. Everybody agrees. Well, you all know I'm right. You're seeing me. I'm right. He's right. He's right. But you haven't all said it to each other. So when we all say it together at the end of this presentation, then we sit down for the panel and say, okay, what are we going to do? If everybody in the community agrees this is the way we ought to go, then don't you think we ought to go this way? Okay. So this definition has been peer reviewed. If you want to get to it, it's ZWIA, Z -W -I -A, Zero Waste International Alliance.org. It's in there. There's uh, all the slideshows from our latest uh, presentation the workshop we did in Davos, Switzerland. I had uh, a CAN expert from around the world give presentations at this uh, international uh, world resort forum. Pretty amazing. These guys have figured it out. Too. That's what I do. It's time. They, they, uh, Dennis Meadows from Linus to Growth. <laughs> it's older. It's about when they first computers, they took all the information they had in the world and they threw it into a computer that was this big and tried to figure out uh, when the population of the world would take over the amount of resources available. I'll show you that chart. And the bottom line was like 2000, it was 1970. I'm going, like, that's the revolution. Have and have nots. Uh, actually, it was. Uh, that's when they built all the plants in India and in China. And all the resources started when the Mar landfills to Walmart, China, to build stuff that you have. So that was a revolution. And we are on a recycle side. So this, this, has been, this has been around the world. It's more peer reviewed by everybody. This is our definition. When they say I'm zero away from landfill, you say, yeah, but think about that. If you take this to an incinerator, one third of that what goes in is still got to go to the And it's probably pretty toxic. So basically, it's the here's our current principle that we're working on today. Because everybody's worried about it. Everybody understands the climate. Everybody sees the polar caps are melted. Uh, so we have this thing called a waste bridge. And what you see today is bottles and cans and newspapers and stuff coming to landfill. But down upstream, when you talk about cutting down trees, blowing up mountains to get coal, getting wood out of the forest, mining, this is, there's 70, it's, uh, 71 tons upstream of trash, of waste. Mining waste, uh, wood residual, uh, energy waste uh, for every product you have. And if you use it once and toss it over, what are you doing with the finite resources on the planet? But what, the other thing that's driving this thing today is that everybody's doing these climate plans. And across the state, at every climate plan, what's the number one, two, or three generator of greenhouse gases? The local landfill. Mm -hmm. The local landfill. Huh. How does that compare to feedlots? Okay, so in Fresno, maybe it's the feedlot, but not down here. <laughs> but agriculture is in the top three as well, and a lot of it's the feedlot. A lot of it's just uh, pesticides and petrochemicals that are dropped in. These are greenhouse carbons as well. <laughs> so the landfill creates methane. Methane is like 70, 21 to 72 times, depending on who, what experts in the room, more potent than CO2. It's anthropogenic, meaning that we created this stuff. It wasn't nature, it was a natural thing. So, Here's something that we can fix. That's the number one greenhouse gas generator in our community, and it's, it's a problem. Plus, if this is the other, this is what drove AB32. Uh, Arnold, nuts. I mean, that's why he did it. That's why we went to the FY341 says 75 percent recycling. They figured out if you if you recycled and composted everything in California that could be recycled and composted, you would eliminate the CO2 emissions from every single automobile, the equivalent to, if you do, you go to the EPA war model, waste reduction and recycling model, you could just plug in the amount of recyclables in there and it'll tell you how much greenhouse gas you'll save by doing that rather than using the virgin material. So these are, these, it's a global warming, but it's a resource issue, but it's really, it's a planning issue and it's really, it's about your children. So, but these are the premises. Jump in, anybody thinks, uh, I'm right, everything I say is true, and I challenge you to, to deal with it. What will happen is somebody catches it, they'll catch me that I do have, I do exaggerate. You know, 75% of everything, every statistic is a lie to you. Just make that up. <laughs> <laughs> I read that in the book, I thought that was a great line. 
Um, who would do this? Is this so? No, it's not cutting edge. 2002 was cutting edge. Today, um, all over the world, cities are adopting zero waste goals and zero waste plan. Italy, uh, five years ago, had Pyrula, and uh, they decided to go with it. Now, the government in Rome doesn't back it, it's all local. The young people organizing 200 cities in Italy now are at zero waste goals, and about 80 of them have hit 90%. I said, Paul, what's in the truck? Is it half of its diapers, Rick? Uh, there's a product that, did we demand a diaper that goes in the landfill? Is that what we said to Procter and Gamble? Uh, said, no, just covering my kid's butt, or they catch it. Uh, if I could wash it, that would be nice. If I could flush it, that would be nice. Why do I have to throw it in my trash and, and put it in the landfill and bring all that toxic material to get into the ground? It's tough. All these cities and more are adopting it around the world. Uh, we'll get the countries picking this up. And in our country, the EPA is picking it up. In California, uh, we have over 30 cities now. We have no idea. Oh, we probably have five counties. Uh, so we got the city of San Diego to do a zero waste. We'll come back this spring with a plan. Uh, our local group, Zero Waste San Diego, we still have done a listserv and a website for, for oh, five, ten years. My daughter can do it because you're talking, Dad, but nothing's happening. So we did get the city to turn over. And so now we're doing a zero waste symposium on February 4th in San Diego where we're going to talk about uh, all the different edibles and composting, you know, all the, the, the highest and best use from the edible line, from the from the organic line to the reuse line. I, I can tell you some of the theory on this, but we're putting it all together, uh, and I got a call from a member of the Board of Supervisors. I've been about 10 years with a member of the Board of Supervisors that I called me, and then I was working in the county. I'd be calling. This guy called and said, you know, I really like what you're doing. I want to be part of it. So, I see a motion, and if I can get him to get a final second, a motion a second to look at a zero waste zone for San Diego County. <laughs> you can do it in Ohio, you can do this in Ventura County. Three of you at the meeting says yes. Uh, would you do it? The three of you said it, the board members would go, well, I'll go to one. Uh, maybe, Sam, tell me what's, tell us, come back and tell us what a zero waste goal is and what it plans. That's all the staff has been waiting for. Would you to tell the council or the board that's what you want, and the board to give them permission to think that way. San Diego, they couldn't see they zero waste until the council said, we are now zero. Now everything's on the table. It's not 50%, half-assed, just half of it. Everything's on the table. So these are the cities that are doing it, and there's more. Oh, is it attainable? So uh, we did this, uh, about the scientific community for the World Research Forum in Switzerland, and we get papers from all over the world. That, she turned in the paper and it said, is zero waste a myth? And uh, she had some uh, assumptions. She hadn't finished her paper. And a uh, little that I have, and I shouldn't have done it, I said, okay, what happened? Well, her position was that uh, zero waste was a myth, and it was a dangerous myth, because uh, if people believed there was zero waste, they would consume more. <laughs> and, and anybody who's talked about zero waste has never obtained it. Was that, well, my friend said, well, you know, it's, it's not mythology, it's not religion, it's science. It's like when you have anything, you measure it at 100%. All, and then you measure how you probability, that's a different reason, how close you get. So we say, well, you can't get to zero weight. You say, surely. Okay, fine, damn close. How about that? How about 99.999? Now, I know in the house I can get the 99%. In a factory, Pond is doing 98%. In a city, now, you know, stuff coming in from everywhere else, you have a lot of issues. But I think as, as we understand the world situation, the value of these resources, and we make some general rules, they will be revealed and the money will be there too. So let's look at nature, look what nature does. That's the model. There's no waste in nature. Whatever's left over from something is something else is each stock. That's the way we ought to design. It's biomimicry. It's the, if you want to read the book by Jermaine Bennett, it's a very good book. Well, basically, if they look at doing inventions, they're going to look at a caterpillar. How does a caterpillar crawl off the wall? Well, what, what's the set traction all about? So, inventions are based on that kind of stuff. So, we say nature's a model. Yeah, yeah, darn close. How about that? Okay, 2040, if you're not at zero, if you're at 98% paid. Japan, they use cut off. Uh, Every year, better food. Trying to get better every year. So, uh, continual improvement. That's all. Set goals. 
set of direction that everybody understands. We're talking about zero. We're not talking about ever looking at a landfill or an incinerator again because that's poison in our air, that's poison in our water, it's wasting our resources. So there's got to be a better way. And once that's the rule, that's how we do it. Not only 10% of the next days, because 2% of us are insane at any time. <laughs> I didn't think about it. I threw my cup in the trash. I'm sorry. I forgot my, I forgot my canvas bag. I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> Around the world, we, we can could, we could find now businesses taking the lead on this. And in nine, we've got many businesses that are 9 years In Japan, they went zero waste global about 15 years ago. And every major business who's located in Japan on the uh, 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 zero waste company. So on the website, you'll see it. There's zero waste company. Toyota even advertise you. Even though on the car, the car disappears in the fire. We're not just environmental, we're zero waste. And they, the guy from Honda went to our zero waste business meeting in Cincinnati. He didn't reveal himself because he wanted to go and listen to the guy from the University talk about his program because he's our know, plant engineer. Okay. All right, and Procter Gamble, and he's zero waste in his diaper making plant. Congratulations, you're a good guy, but you're making diapers to cry out loud. No, I'm just a plant manager, I don't design the product. Okay, maybe maybe the force ought to be able to feed back into that. Okay, but what we're saying now, it, here's what it's all about. It's, a, it's all about no burn, no bury. It's all about local democracy. It's all about telling the manufacturers of our products to make them design for re recycling, reuse, or composting. Period. I would make a law in California that says you can't sell anything in my state if it's not recyclable or compostable. Or you can, but you have to take it back. Yeah. I think, why not? Why should we spend taxpayer money to put into our landfill clothes, toxifying our water or air, or even taking that chance? Why would we allow them to put products on there that are killing us, folks? I'm sorry. Oh, you get started there. So, Businesses are doing it, and it's okay. I'm not selling out here. I'm just telling you they are. I'm really a government guy. I am. But all these businesses are zero waste. And I am on the U.S. Zero Waste Business Council because they say, hey, Rick, how do we get the zero waste in my factory? Well, that's pretty easy. One, look what you're buying. And two, get on the line. Take a look at what you're wasting. And if you're wasting stuff that you're buying, why are you buying it? Toyota says, uh, recycle something. And then they say, after you recycle something, recycle some more. Yeah. And after you recycle some more, recycle less. <clears throat> and what do they say? Find out what you're wasting. What's that discard? Oh, it's cardboard. Okay, recycle that cardboard. Do we need cardboard? Well, how about a reverse packaging system where there is no pack the package comes in and goes back, back and forth, uses it over and over again. And that's what they design. They take out the flaws so that they can make it more recyclable. Why? Because they're paying money. And in a, in a time when their times are tight, these guys see this is where the dollars are going. And the money's going to the pension funds. <clears throat> so, this is my favorite. Do they have a Rico copier? Okay. Rico is a big copy machine like Xerox, is the name. Rico adopted zero waste in 1998. They were generating 6,000 tons worldwide. They got about 10 plants around the world. Uh, basically, the president's picture is up there in every room and says zero waste. And the bottom line is, if you don't like that, go work somewhere else. Because in that factory that I own, you do what I do. I pay them for what you do, we tell you to do it, period. Can you do that in the city? I try to argue that before Collins that, you know, why couldn't it you say, uh, we have this great city for Collins with all this good environment? And the rule is, if you live here, you have to separate your bottles and cans and your organics. And you're easily. What's the problem with that? Okay. But these are new rules. You don't have a right to waste. The Constitution never gave the Bible to give you the right to waste. The Bible says steward your resources. So where's this I got the right to make one for the right to waste? Please leave the little. <laughs> 2000, they hit zero, and they have been zero ever since. That money goes in the pension funds, they spread it around. Uh, what the uh, Congress said in uh, Low in Ohio, they had got 98%, and then they realized that it was the cafeteria, the last 2%, all those packages. So they worked on that too, get the 99. And it's, it, now what they have is factory managers who come in out with this training to say, okay, I'm your environmental specialist, and I'll go down the line and I'll make your factory more efficient and I'll make you more money. 
And so there's a triple bottom line. You can save the environment and, and make the customer happy and make the factory happy. So that's a good thing. So that's why this is winning. That's why it's coming. Uh, I wanted to, because I'm inventing, reinventing solid waste management into a resource management, you have to have some basic things. Okay. Now this is where the PhD <laughs> will want to play with me because I do take the laws of thermodynamic and, and redefine it into a rich language. Because I'm a book of science. The stuff, stuff exists. I'm sorry, I have to fix the digital. It doesn't say how it got here or why it got here. It's just here. Okay. Secondly, it's here and it ain't, there ain't no way. You're way in my backyard. My ocean, my blue bite tuna. Clean. That's your way? You gotta throw your trash in the ocean? Come on. There is no way. So that stops it right there. And that and that way includes the air. Why should you put the little pollutants in the air? Why should you put pollutants in the ocean? We are we talk about our food supply. How about the land? Okay, the barrier from the land, so it gets to your water. We're smarter than that, first of all. And we did it better up until 1945 than ever. We, we, we recycled 90% of this country. Every city had a mandatory recycling law. Every city. Of course, we didn't have plastic. Yeah. And we fed up garbage to the other pigs. Uh, okay, so there's no way. And the third one is uh, basically there's no free lunch. That is, okay, it's cheap to dispose of the land, but 20 bucks at a time, it's going to fill that landfill. We already did it. What happens when that landfill's full? What about your kids? What about those resources? What if that landfill starts to pollute the groundwater? And it will. When the land are right. Well, what are you going to do? How do you mitigate the landfill? Well, you have to dig it up. So, your free lunch today, that is your cheap disposal because you threw it in the air. Not you. We let the government do it. We passed one. We backed out of the thing. We said, those are the rules. I guess it's okay. So, okay, what do you think? We'll make new rules. It's not all okay. You can't put it in the ocean, you can't put it in the air. You can't put it on the land. You have to recycle it. You have to compost it, period. Or you can't make it. Otherwise, otherwise you're taking it away from your grandchildren. We probably already did this. We've already toxified our bodies already with all this. My father sucked in lead from a gas station for 40 years on the corner. He lived till he was 90. <laughs> <laughs> but we have put a lot of toxins in our bodies that we don't know what it is. In fact, what happens is we pass the toxins on to our children and our grandchildren. And we've seen huge issues of, of uh, endocrine disrupt disruptors in our food supply based on plastics. Uh, and we've seen family and biphenyl A's causing disease. And Kaiser now has a cluster. You know, is that what it is? You can't have babies. It has to do with plastics. It has to do with babies. And we're now picking it out. So we wrap our food in that stuff. Okay. Did we think about that? I don't know. Oh, what happened was they had this oil barrel and they got all this gas and oil. And there was this little dot at the end that was ethylene. And they said, uh, well, well, why do we do with this ethylene? It's a toxic waste. Mm -hmm. Monsanto. What do we do with this? I don't know. Ah, we'll wrap food in it. <laughs> water. Now that's what it is. Your water bottle is a ethylene, polyethylene, it's a high density polyethylene or a PET polyethylene territory. It's got a biphenol A, keep it flexible. And if you use it five or six times, keep using it, that stuff will go right into your water. Anyway, they, they check Eskimos for dioxin, because we were talking about dioxin, but incinerators, and they found dioxin, and they found biphenol A. How does an Eskimo get biphenol A in their biphenol? Big fish. Right? Little fish, bigger fish eat that, bigger fish eat that. They swallow each other, mattresses, chairs, whatever. <laughs> that whale that was over here on the coast had like uh, 300 plastic bags, published laundry, gym pants. <laughs> this is a big vacuum cleaner, sucking stuff, put it at the shore. You dump it out there, what are you doing? What are we doing? All right, so. That's our free lunch. We can't surf anymore. Any, it's all toxic. You know, we can go in the wire. Live at the beach. I'm very upset about this kind of stuff. Okay. The next principle then is highest and best use is that basically this is a shirt before it's a white towel before it's a rag. This is a chair. But when you're done, it's broken. You can fix it. When it's broken, we can just wood. It's textile. So highest and best use is to do. Here's how this comes down. Organics. Okay. We want to get all the organics. But, Feeding people. What did, what did the Pope just say? They're all eating real big and people are starving. What's that all about? The last Pope said pollution was a cardinal sin. Okay, 
<laughs> Anybody here to hear it? You know, what they're saying is, here's all these restaurants and all these food stores with all this food. This has to go to people. To feed people. The highest investment should feed people, feed animals, feed the land. I'm very proud. Feed people. And we can do this. We're smart enough to run shuttles to halfway houses and to the mission to feed people. Feeding America is doing it with some of the biggest restaurants in the world. This is the biggest in Fort Collins, San Diego. We do public dialogue. This is people we're talking about. And this is something we can do as people. A high end topic. The same thing with clothing and chairs and tables and grandma stuff. It just breaks my heart to see that stuff go to the doctor. And be smashed. It's, you know, it's some of these things got jumped. That's what they do. Go right from the state sale, right to the land. I got pictures of Cole Cannon's house. And those are this Bam! Reusable from the land. Straight out bam. Put them in a warehouse. Then let the thrift stores do it. Then, then some of the other. And finally, just send them on to recycle the soft quality material. We have great stuff. Our, our used clothing is being sold in stores for a lot of money up in Oregon because it's a lot of good stuff. We do. We live very high. Oh, okay, so this is the. <laughs> sorry, I don't pull any balloons, but let's do it. So we're sitting in, uh, and Java was talking about you know, changing on the road, and one of the guys looks at me and says, you know, keep talking about this 10%. He said, you're in the top 10%. I didn't talk 10 The world. Really? Well, if you own a house, you got a net worth of about 800000 you're top percent in the world. Now, on one hand, I'm proud of the top 10% of one, but I am. My God, think of the bottom 10%. How low they are. They have nothing, and we have so much. So part of it is change our lifestyle. This is what we're talking about. They're talking about in Europe. They're talking about uh, culture change. They're talking about closed loop economies. No more landfills and centers keeping things rolling in. And decoupling. And what they're saying is we're on a track towards unsustainability. We have to decouple from that track and do it. And it starts at the local level. It really does. So, okay, so this is the basic. If you're doing any science, this is all you get from you, okay? But bottom line is I talked about the Club of Rome report from. Uh, um, SMOs. Okay, so this is this is the infinite amount of resources. This is 1900. This is 2100. The number of resources on planets diminishes as the hard line population goes up. 2000. When that was talked two years ago, 30 years later, we did this one like that. So I showed this one because not because it's population control, but why would you bury resources in the ground or burn them? <clears throat> when there are some scarce, when the population is growing and they become scarce, the value of all these materials are tenfold than what they were ten years ago. Yeah. So you can now take your blue bin to a, a MRF and they'll pay you for it. We changed. And then on the, this is what this is old. This is EPA. This is what Arnold saw in 1832. You take glass, metal, steel, and aluminum. You recycle them all. These are the reductions in energy, air, water, mining waste, and water use if you do that. So when I said if you do all that, we would take all the exhaust from all the cars and do it. That's huge. That's huge. And we should as thing is if a guy like I and Eric can figure this one out, anybody can do it. It's not very true, right? This is not it's just all we need now is the public to say, yeah, it comes at all at the same time, and we'll get there. And, Again, Todd and Gloria, the interim mayor, because they kicked the owner out. I'm sorry. We finally got a Democrat in, and it's a dirty old man. What are you going to do? <laughs> so, Todd, Todd in the state of the city, speaks talked about zero waste the first time in San Diego's history. Uh, so, here's, here's the way we look at this stuff. Here's the way we look at this stuff. Okay, we used to say uh, waste management, okay? It's not waste management anymore. It's upstream and downstream, okay? And I like upstream. I use prevention, my friends. Prevention. Prevent the stuff in the first place. How do you do it? Well, you run a clean factory. Two, you redesign products so that they fit your capabilities in your city or in your building. Redesign. And then you ask the local businesses to take stewardship over that. And that's how you do it. If you can do it by rules, I mean, that's the plastic bag bans are an example of, of uh, stewardship. We're talking about the bag. Now the stores are coming in and saying, yeah, oh, man, that's okay. We're open. Our business is more well, paper or plastic bag bans. But to me, Fan bag bags are good. I think it's fine. I, 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 I'm really upset about the ocean. But 6% of what's going to land go to 9%. 6%. That's huge. That's more than that. 
And that's got goofy little toxic Very stuff in it. And old men stuff that's got barium or whatever from their radiation treatments. And these guys will, their garbage trucks to a scale at the landfill and the alarms go off because there's nuclear radiation going into the plant. Literally. Happened all the time. So they have to find out where that diaper was. So why not redesign to something that works in our system? So that's what helps me prevention. And you know, the thing is you have the power of the city to do that. Not just to make rules, but to buy. LA buys a billion dollars worth of stuff. If everything LA bought was recyclable or usable, or imagine the generation of change that would cause just by putting out that kind of money under those kinds of rules. And that's what we're saying. We're going to make new rules that, that basically want you to go the right way, not the wrong way. Because once you subsidize the landfill or the incinerator, what you've done is subsidize wasting. Let's get them out, take them out of the picture, take them out of the whole thing. Downstream, I call that recovery. Okay, we've got reuse for recovery, we've got composting for recovery, we have recycling, and there's this group of people that we've discovered, the self home. And it turns out it's a lot of people. People who go to the landfill once or twice a year, or all the time because they don't have a hauler, and they need to have the ability to put their stuff in the right place as well. So I'll show you so. So now I'm going to start getting down to some detail. Because what I think we ought to do is just change our plans. Again, highest and best shoes. So the first thing is get rid of all the political impediments with being subsidies. Now push for clean production and what we're calling producer responsibility. Extended producer responsibility. If we want to talk about it later, I'll bring it up. But it's just a, a, a new idea of, uh, of trying to use to, to, to have the producers take the responsibility over the products. So there's a lot of debates here. It's a good idea, really, especially in toxic materials. Uh, for paper material, I'm not sure you. there's a system all set up. So anyhow, how do I do so? <coughs> As you want to. Then reduce, reduce, and return, reuse, recycle, regulate. And then it's never OK to incinerate or landfill. Now what we would say is, look, if you all do this, you all do this. Um, There'll be a small residual. We know this. You sort of garbage you know, to figure out in the last ten percent. I can get you ninety percent. I'll show that next. We can get you ninety percent. But in the last ten percent, there's stuff uh, baby diapers. So diapers, not di baby diapers. Diapers, six percent. Okay. Okay. Now what's in the last four percent? Two percent is those comp composite items you, you're thinking about: metal, paper, glass component kind of stuff. And then there's another two percent that's uh, we call it legacy weights and mistakes. So something that was produced 50, 80 years ago, lead it paint. This is one I use, lead it wood. I don't know to do what to do with lead wood. I could sell wood. I could compost wood. But if I got lead on wood, I don't want to compost it. I don't. I don't want the lead into the mix, right? And I don't want to burn it. So I look at a double line landfill as maybe the right place to put lead wood. As a secure place to put it, I have it on the place. If I get 90%, that's the capacity I have for that. So that's that's how we work that one through. And and it, that's a lot of debate. What do you do? Because we don't want to end up burning. What 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 is a subtitle D land? Okay, under uh, the federal law of record, uh, resource conservation and recovery act, subtitle D says that landfills. And it's landfill regulation. So a subtitle D landfill meets federal rules for double liners, pumping systems, uh, methane recovery programs. It's a subtitle D. Because not all landfills are subtitle D. That's the other thing. That's what the question in my mind, but up in the Fresno area, west of there, there's some there's some okay. toxic place. Oh, Kettleman Hill. 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 What was it? Kettleman Hill. Kettleman. Yes. Yeah. Waste management's toxic. Small your has this waste go there. What what is that? Is that a Title D also? No, that's bigger than that. It's a full blown hazardous waste facility. It's oh, pretty intensive. In fact, when we we had uh, ran up in the same area where we were putting these pesticide containers, I didn't like it. That's what they were doing. They had farmers have to do something with that stuff. We thought, why not trip, why not just have returnable containers? The industry got a little upset. They said that. When, when those new rules came in, Charlie looked at it and said, we can't afford to do this. We walked out of the business and left to stand and run and take care of it. But the waste management is that they're bringing from, from all over, I mean, everywhere. And I think that what they said 40 years ago about those people being hung by it, I think they're not proven that they are being hung. They, but you walk in, you drive in there, guys got us, you know, Cadillac, and all the windows are now going. That's the first one. 
and it throws a nickel over to the, the, the back, but they then it was in the old days, it's just a good one, just dump the stuff, and we drew that backwards. Yeah, no, I, why, so why should we be, why should we, people have to have a responsibility of dealing with this toxic material after somebody made a huge profit and doesn't even live here? He, the owner of the company ought to live in Kettleman. The guy who, whoever produces this toxic waste ought to live in Kettleman. We always say, incinerators will take the stack and point it to the board of directors room. <laughs> All right, come on, let's be fair about this thing. Yeah. I have two questions. What what is a double line landfill? And two, okay. what what rate, uh, year range was it going on with the Kettleman facility? Okay, well, we I hit Fresno in uh, 79, 70, uh, 80, uh, 76 was the wreck rough. Uh, when was uh, uh, Love Canal? About 1978, 79. So Love Canal. When Hooker Chemical took all their chemicals and buried it in the North 40 of the property, and then they went and moved somewhere and they gave the property to the school district. They built a school and a whole suburb of the And then they had this huge cancer cluster that got revealed to the world. They really did. Well, Canal became the banner for Hazardous Waste. And their kids, they were getting cancer in that area. Uh, at that point, EPA took all the money out of everything else in Recra and put it into a Hazardous Waste Control. So uh, Kettle, we went from Blue Hills to Kettleman. Around the 80s, so that's not long. Double liner is under subtitle D. Uh, you can't have uh, garbage into the soil. You have to. There's a there's a line. There's a stuff you have to put down gravel, then a, a liner, then a vein of stone, and some other stuff, and then another liner. So it's a double double liner. These are about uh, big thick plastic you know, liners, but we know they're going to rip. Uh -huh. We know. And you mentioned that some get pumped out. Where does it, where does it, what they pump out go? Uh, to a hazardous waste. What about the plastic that the lining's made out of that Well, yeah, I don't mind. Yeah, so, uh, you think the gas that comes out of landfills, uh, it's not just pure methane. There's a lot of chlorine and other stuff. So where is that coming from? It's got to be from the methane pipes and the stuff in the landfill. I don't know. What you got is a big hole of stuff that's been covered every day that's sort of, depending on how much water, what's in there, is doing its own thing. God knows what's going on. And in the late, in the late 80s and early 90s, there were so much brain tumors and cancers going on near Modesto in that area that the CDC and people back east in Bethesda were thinking of bringing out a team to figure out why so. Well, the second most polluted air basin is the San Joaquin Valley. Number one is LA. It all flows in from San Francisco, flows down the valley to Bakersfield, and comes up. Fresno, I moved out. I left Fresno. I mean, it was a nice place, but I couldn't see the sun for three months. And the bugs just kept getting bigger and bigger. You know, they spray these big fields and monocultures, and so they kill off all the little ones. So we were seeing stuff I'd never heard of before. Let me, let me get back to garbage. <laughs> so, so when you look at when you look at what you throw out in your discos, so what we do, the way we do it is, I, you know, I'm the poly sci guy at the engineering firm. So I said, we just got a contract from the state of California to figure out to put some garbage, right? Get a recycler. So get a crew of people and throw up this garbage. Uh, literally, we did the first garbage store in California, uh, said, uh, a team of ex-cons and myself at uh, uh, three, Davis Street, Dewey Island, and these were all active levels at the time, and the sweats transfer station, uh, a lot team of and sort of those day seven categories, so when I went to Fresno, we had the college do it, and we did 12 categories. Uh, today, garbage sorts are back at uh, 54, 54 categories. So, and so what I can do now is take those 54 categories and I put them in the market category. That is, if I have all the paper, so it's just paper, it's paper, from tissue all the way up to ledgers, I can sell it as paper. It's a mixed paper market that good. I can do the same with metal, I can do the same with plastic. So what we do is, this Dan Knapp invented, so I have to give him a plug. He's a PhD sociologist that got tired of teaching, went to work at a dump. And they said, okay, we want to recover these materials. Okay, why? So he started separating them into market categories. And then he realized there were all the highest and best use stuff, and he went out and set up a store uh, in front of the landfill, all this stuff, chairs and tables. And our urban ore is like 500,000 square feet in Berkeley, and it's a multi million. I'll show you a picture of them. But basically, it's idea is that everything has a reduced potential. So, what I want to say to you guys, which I think is really important. We're doing a real good job with the plastics and the metals and the glass. 
in the paper. So at least that collection system before it. But look at half half of a coin in the landfill is a it's a recipe for compost. Half of it. Look at plant debris, because of which are food, things are hot, soil, wood, and all oh, part of paper. Okay, the food dirty paper, tissues. This is what they're doing in San Francisco. Bay Area, Berkeley, Oakland, San, everywhere in the north. They're taking this half and bringing them, they're composting it, they're putting them on vineyards, so they're selling. We need to do this here. We need to do this here. And what I want to say that about this is, is that uh, the airport just realized that the number one generator of the landfill was this stuff, uh, greenhouse gases. The airport realized that. The airport just said to Cal Recycle and everybody else, oh, the best way to mitigate it is not to allow it in the landfill in the first place. And what we're saying is compostable organics need to be out of the landfill. And if you want to direct it to farms, that's fine. I say, I'm going to let the biofuel guys play against the compost guys. I'm an aerobic digestion kind of guy, not an anaerobic guy, but still, it's all about food to me, not fuel. But half of it is, and we can do it ourselves, and we've proved it all over the state that people will do the service. So it's a no brainer. Yeah? So we will see this year. Uh, right. Yeah. What's, what's this profile from? Is this a generic or a sort uh, from somewhere? So I do this in every city I, I do it in, and sometimes they're bigger, sometimes they're smaller. Usually it's the paper, so it's like in Fort Collins, it was a little higher. Colorado, they don't have any bands, so the use was less than three percent, it was eight percent. But guys like Cascadia, they're a big company, and they, they get hired by these city counties. Mm -hmm. Have you sort of inventory? Eugene Sun. Oh, too bad. Okay, but now Eugene's okay. But Cascadia's got the forty two sort down, so all I have to do is find the sorting information. Now I got my market there. Because my plan is not a waste plan, my plan is a market plan. Market. So you know what your markets are, you know what they're worth, and then you can set up your programs to get the material to do it. Let me show you that. So these are the market categories. I just showed you on the pie chart. Polymers are plastics. Uh, uh, ceramics are rocks. Rocks. Well, they're sitting on that are rocks. Why don't you bury rocks, grind them up, and make them into aggregate? <laughs> as soon as they passed AB 939, and they said 50%. Had to be done. No public works director in California would dare ever put rocks in the landfill. <laughs> they wouldn't do it, and they know they they were doing it before because they could cheap, they could they were cheap disposal. But rocks are aggregate; they can take. In Fort Collins, it's an aggregate yard. Oceans are the same thing. All the rocks and all the aggregates in one yard, and they sell it or make it available for other people. They grind it up and use it for building materials. It's a great idea. Okay, so now uh, pretrustable things that rot. This is an old term. We used to have garbage bales. I mean, garbage was not paper, garbage was for food. And you used to have a small pail that was sealed, and it would go to the local pig farmer. Mm -hmm. Up until 1960, uh, the cryptosis and the public health department, and they had to uh, boil garbage to feed the, the animals. I'm on the island of Hawaii, and we're going to eat Marvin and his pig farms, <laughs> and they're cooking mangoes. <laughs> mangoes and papayas, the, people, the pigs, I just love it. It was such a good <laughs> atmosphere to be at a pig farm. So, if I had those market clusters, and then we did this, uh, this was uh, started as the first zero waste plan we did was in Del Norte, Del Norte County in 1998. And so, we did have our categories, and they said, okay, clusters, so, you know, do this. And so, it turns out that if you take an average person in a rural area and offer a recycling program, bottles and cans, they'll put stuff in a blue bin. They'll, they'll separate papers and things. Usually there's a bunch. Even in, in, in uh, that city, in Del Norte, which is Crescent City, I and mean, that's a big city, 6,000 people, uh, there, wasn't a, there was a drop off center for bottles and cans. There wasn't a buy But the 15% hardcore you guys would save it in your backyards and take it to the drop off center. You would also feed your food to your animals and, uh, on your own farm because it's a rural community. And then your clothing and furniture you would take to the church. Of course you would. And so there would be special discards that you'd have to get rid of, like construction demolition, like when you throw it out of the garage or put it in the bedroom. And that usually would go to the landfill. So these are basically clusters. And so if I have 12 categories and I say, ah, you're going to break your nuts and not be good at full insert 12 categories. Here, put in your blue bin, and I got four categories just taken away. 
Just like that. Now they tell you to mixing them together. I know these are high value materials. We got glass. We got we got we got the magnets that pull the metal out. We can figure out how to separate. There's some contamination. We can work this one through. We can provide our containers. But these four are high volume. These move fast. These are global. These go in bales and go anywhere in the world. These before glass might be an issue. Plastic metals and papers are a feedstock of industry. Period. Put them in a bale. Put them on a freight car. You put them on a boat. They'll go anywhere in the world. Or mechanics, this is local stuff. This is local. This is local money, local products going back into your local economy for local food or food security. So that when the big one comes and you don't have any oil, you at least have some food growing out here. Local food. So you put it in a green bin. And I just got four more categories taken care of. So a lot of lack of furniture and stuff that are usable, that's local too. That's your thrift stores. That's the stuff that stays in the community. And I can say that. This is my epiphany in Fort Collins. My God, the global stuff we're going to go out no matter what. This is the infrastructure we want to build in our community for food, for, for clothing, for composting, for reusables, because that stays, the money stays within our economy. And then finally, the last stuff is uh, the rocks and the construction stuff. And we need to figure out what to do with that. So part of it, they said, okay, here's your clusters. So for your paper, the organic, reusable products, special designs, you're going to have to have something. So in recyclables, we have a MRF, the Materials Recovery Facility. These, these facilities have people separate them, they've got magnets and stuff. For organics, there's a composting facility. For reuse and repair, I see a warehouse with homeless people doing dismantling your stores. Just don't put the stuff in the landfill, put a charge on it, that will fund the warehouse. For your construction and demolition, we've got over 300 CNB facilities now. Basically, you can put it, if you don't do it on site, you put it in a bin and they put it in a belt and pull the rocks in the wood out. Big deal. And regulating materials don't go into a landfill. They don't. So let me just show you some things. And I'm almost done. I am. Okay, so here's the economics. Here's the economics. This is, this is the state of Delaware. Now, Delaware hired us because. Uh, New Jersey and Pennsylvania had 50% recycling rates and they had 4% recycling rates. I said, well, first of all, the Delaware Solid Waste Authority subsidizes the lamp building and center to the point that it's much cheaper to waste in Delaware than to recycle. You guys did it yourself. You're taking taxpayers' money and funding the incinerator. But let me show you what you got here. And I like the chart because it's a million tons a year. Okay? So you take that same pie chart that I showed you with the same percentages, but I adjusted it for Delaware. Of course I did. And these are the same categories. And it comes out in a million, this amount of tons a year of each, this 28,000 tons of reusables, 100,000 tons of plant trimmings, which is 110,000 tons of plastics. Okay. Then I took a market price. And my market price are very conservative. Uh, when we did when we did reusables at Cold Canyon for two days, Dan and Mary Lou estimated 1500 bucks a ton. I did 500 for Collins that hit the roof because it was $6 million for crying out loud. Everybody. No, no. So we have to sell $400. It's still a huge amount. And when you look at over here and read it, the 15 million is one third of the money still left on the reusables. And very sofas and clothing at the land of nuts. Who's watching? $20 for paper? Nah, $100 today. Um, these are probably right. Uh, polymer's about right. Metal had a low price as well. But the bottom line is that it's $47 million. And I sat there with the head of the Chamber of Commerce for the state of Delaware and I said, look, uh, I can promise you $50 million added to your economy. Oh, and by the way, when you, when you subsidize the incinerator and landfill, you kill the paper recycling jobs and the metal recycling jobs because you allow everybody to mix them and bury them for free. Had you liberated that, you would create 2,000 new jobs. So 2,000 new jobs, well, LA was like 15,000, 25,000, San Diego, 60 million dollars. I mean, we're talking 100 million dollars. We're talking a huge amount of money that's being buried because we have subsidized people's right to waste. So it's the last change on the table. To me, we all agree it's stupid. Well, no. <laughs> no so, so we just fix it. We just get a new plan and we fix it. Here's some examples. This is the reuse. I talk about reuse clusters. So when I talk about reuse, we're talking about old wood. We're talking about people that restore. You can buy old wood there. Uh, any kind of, what we need is a materials exchange so that you can go and buy an old ballast or an old window frame. What's happening is like, you know, we're restoring our little cottage home. You know, so 
some, something special, craftsman or some special development. And so we want to find crafting kinds of stuff to fix it in there. Well, you can't find that at IKEA. You got to go find a material store. Some demo guy, smart. So these guys, last chance mercantile, they're sitting on the landfill in uh, in, in uh, Monterey. So you go in the door, go in the door, you go in last chance mercantile. And all your durable goods and your products are unloaded right here. I'll do tours, zero waste, uh, uh, zero waste one on one. We start saying you want to take them off the coast. Pretty cool. So we'll stop here. We'll watch these guys. You'll we'll see the vendors. And they're standing and watching each truck. You know, pick the stuff up before you even hit the show. <laughs> In Hawaii, it's drop and shop. They don't even really regulate it. They just load it. They'll clear the house every two days. Um, this is an East Coast one. Uh, this is Dan and Mary Lou. I always put it in there. Urban Orange, uh, 500,000 square feet in Berkeley. Uh, their outside yard is huge. They thought they were going to rent some of the space to repair industries. It turned out that they filled it off. And they're millionaires. I mean, they, it's a self, it's the employees own it, but they're making millions. Yeah. Because if you've got a Victorian home in Berkeley, you're going to go to Urban Orange for that kind of thing. If you're a college student and you're looking for a pair of designer jeans, they got an Urban Orange. Um, you need a desk or a chair or a bicycle? We don't want you at all. Uh, so, and he's a capitalist. He's a, uh, he, uh, he really believes in free enterprises. And uh, we think that would be teaching. Uh, okay, so here's your organic cluster. And this, this have, these are all California scenes. And basically, you just separate the landscaping and the gardeners all together. That's most of the art material, anyhow. I want to pick up separate, so separate dumping. Uh, these are the kinds of equipment that's this is covered today. That's a tub grinder, that's all you need. It's a couple of thousand dollars, but it grinds up all the material into uh, fine particles. And then they set them up in these things called windmills. So this is aerobic and it's uh, on the land, it's open air. Um, and uh, that's it. And you keep turning it once you get the soil out of it. And this here is in San Jose where they had an air emission issue. So they put the bags on top and they inject air, so it's a static aeration system. All right, so the air board says, oh, big problem, air emission from complex. Crying out loud, those oil refineries and those, those the toys are pulling half of the air, and you're worried about a 1%? Well, oh, it's over the line, because those guys are grandfathered in the flag. They're going to close down all outdoor systems. Well, we're running 200,000 tons in San Diego. Aerobic, in room, outdoor, and the airport is not on our back, it works just fine. But the answer to that is, is, a, is an in vessel system, meaning that it's enclosed. And there's some good reason for the in vessel systems in present day kind of cloud community. Bad cow disease. Well, who knows what's going to be in that complex? So you have a windrow, maybe this last quarter of the windrow is not going to get turned right and it's not going to decompose. It has to be in a vessel. So any kind of serious composting with foods has to be in a vessel. But you can put a vessel inside a warehouse and, and do a static aeration. And we saw at Disney, that Disney World, it was beautiful. They, didn't, they, they, had, they wanted to build a new land. They would have to go to sewer treatment plant to do it. And some ingenious figured, oh, we'll get all the food scraps before they hit the dump. We'll compost them right there on the side. We'll use so they used was a static aeration system. It was a pile of food track with air coming from the bottom. We came in 100 feet, 100 yards from the area, and there's lands all around and hotels can smell that. Uh, they use it for the irrigation districts all around, all around the land. And basically, it's just coming from all the food restaurants. They just the, the potato peels and the cucumber peels are all. I don't think they cook anymore. I don't understand. There's wax on that stuff. I don't know. That, sorry. Okay, so organics. And that's important. I mean, when we start talking about people now and uh, talking about food you eat, how it's grown, and then what happens to it. It's a whole cycle thing. And, and uh, my, uh, my nephew's a uh, chef, and he's talking about how he goes and buys food, he looks for organic farms, because when he's going to feed people in this class restaurant, it's all going to be good healthy food. But I started looking at that, and then he started looking at how they run the kitchens. And they they want to have the ability to put organics like in San Francisco in a separate bin and take it to a compost. Chef on a field They run their kitchen as a manager. Okay, so that's your organic cluster. Right there. Recycling cluster, you've seen it all. Uh, you've seen these around. This is a materials recovery facility. It's based a series of belts. Um, these things like bandits, bandits, uh, 
They're now using lasers for different types of plastics to blow them off right. Any currency and non the stock. Create these bales. These bales then are put on big ships and taken to China. And this is our resource recovery part in San Luis Obispo. It's pretty simple, but you just drive it and you put things in the right bay. I like them down on the ground rather than elevated because people come in the trucks and unload the gravity. You make people put these up here. You're, you're not dealing with your customer. That's your customer. This is your customer guy in a pickup truck with loaded with cardboard. He's going to get 100 bucks a ton for it. He probably has a ton and a half in this truck. And this is in Glendale. This is that waiting line to get in. Because each one of these Merck have a buyback center because why not? You bring them separately, you bring your money for it. These are money generators for all communities. That's all I see. All right, so get down. So then the last is your, your construction and deconstruction. So this is those ground up blocks. And finally, this stuff. And this stuff has to be everywhere. My sense is that if they sell it at Home Depot, they should have to take that into container. Why should we have to spend an enormous amount of money uh, recovering uh, material? In San Diego, they're only open on Saturday. But it turned out that's terrible. It turns out. It took us 10 years to generate enough chemicals and stuff in the back where my wife said, you know, you do this or we're going to dump it. You find call and made an appointment, drove up, there was no line, in and out, and so it's probably better that way. Uh, HDR thinks that if you collect it uh, door to door, um, it's cheaper. I don't know. My sense is he brought it into the town, he needs to take it back. So we have laws on mattresses and paints now. So we're going to see you got a paint thing going on with the county here? Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you. They are now requiring these guys to take the ownership of their material and take them back. And that's all good. That's all good. Okay. So, how about you? Huh, right on top. This, this is the last thing I wanted to talk about was the resource recovery. Uh, because the cell phone thing, because the county's here, because there's land still, what do you do with no land? When you turn it into a composting facility, because they got to have dirt for final cover. They have to have two feet of good dirt for final cover after they put that cap on. So why not put it right there on the landfill? It also should have a buyback center. And this was in England. In England, you um, we in the center of the We had a great job. I spent a year in you know, probably in uh, Norwich. It's like cold, but they never got over zero for a month. I learned about that. But in England, the government takes care of residential multi families. All the people. That's interesting to sign its own. So, and the EU is facing out land. So, the price of land was over $2,400 a ton now. So, we came in and said, look, uh, you bring in your truck, now, sorted in categories, and you come in here and you drop in the reuse area. There's a store. Recycling areas over here. The composting areas over here. The soil production is over here. Ceramics over here. A little bit of cutting waste can for polished iron and out the door. And then the big trucks come in on the outside and pick up all the bale material for markets. And then all around the outside here is your new cottage industry. And we were hired by a charity who was looking for a job. That's what, that's what Maxine did. And she found a job for people that were signed for her. So she wanted this to create the resources. And that's true. She had composting jobs. She had refrigerator repairmen and all these clothing. It was a great idea. Um, and we've got this right now being in consideration of, as I said, sometimes we bring a new idea somewhere and uh, the architect decided to file a patent on our intellectual property. Hey, I give it away for free. You take it, do what you want with it, make it happen. Uh, he, now we can't do anything because there's a lawsuit on who owns the idea. This is nonsense. Oh my this is not going to try to change the world. I don't even have a lot of time. So, you know, basically, the bottom line is. Uh, there's about, when you look at the last one, this is an eco site. This is probably pretty good. When we start the panel discussion, we start talking about where we want to go, what we want to do. These are, this is the zero waste upstream, upstream, downstream. Approach. Start with clean production, put it to retail stores, bring consumer buying, produce responsibility, resource recovery parks, jobs, jobs, jobs. Change the rules on top, get everybody on the same page, shift the tax subsidies to do what you want them to do and design for the environment out of the top. So, so we say, uh, as Eric says, if not for sure ways, I'm not sure.